I hope you had enough time to consider how each of these pictures has to do with physiology, um, algae, gills of a fish, salmon that we know travel from salt water to fresh water and vice versa. How can they do that? That would kill most other organisms, aquatic marine organisms. And mussels, um, those look like black mussels. I think those are the edible kind, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so you have some barnacles here, limpets. I don't see any chitons, but that looks like it could be a sea anemone pulled in when the tide goes out, you know, pulls its tentacles in, and we saw pictures of that before, so. And this is obviously a rock pool. Tide has gone out. So perhaps after these notes, you'd be able to give a better answer if you have not come up with a good one yet for each of these four pictures. All right, so as I promised, I'm not going to make you define and take notes on all of the cell organelles because you're supposed to be, you're supposed to have already gotten a huge chunk perhaps of your unit six uh, flashcards with the vocabulary word on one side and the definition and the picture on the hand-drawn color picture on the other side of of all of these vocabulary words, uh, cell parts. Most of you, if not all of you in this particular period that's watching this have taken or are taking biology already. So you have covered this material. So I didn't want to recover it. Um, I wanted to just review it um, and, and to get you ready for your unit tests coming up and for the ACE papers also coming up soon enough, okay? So this is just a review really quick again, just a reminder of all the parts that you have to know. If you see a part on here that you don't know, we are gonna be touching on a couple of them. Um, now, of course, your guided notes are just fill in the blanks, so you're not really doing too much uh, effort here. But um, these two first, two first slides are really the main difference between plant cells and animal cells. Um, you know, the large central vacuole, the cell wall, the chloroplasts, um, that is pretty much the main difference. <clears throat> a new word here called a peroxisome. We didn't teach that in biology class. I didn't teach it to my students in biology class. I taught, the, you, I taught my students um, a similar organelle with a similar function called a lysosome. And, uh, but a peroxisome is kind of like a lysosome, but it's specifically made to delete hydrogen peroxide through cellular processes. Hydrogen peroxide buildup, because that is a, um, a corrosive substance if left unattended. Waste product. Animal cell, <clears throat> again, the list of organelles, if there's any of them that you are unfamiliar with. Um, and again, there's no cell wall, just a cell membrane, otherwise called a plasma membrane, or a, um, they called it something else, cell surface membrane, right? All those things are synonymous with each other. Nucleus, which contains the DNA, nucleolus, which makes ribosomes, and then the ribosomes are associated with the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which is typically close to the nucleus. Mitochondrion, powerhouse of the cells. We're going to talk about a couple of these. Okay, so like I said, really quick, we're just going to touch on some of the major ones that both animals and plants share. The biggest difference probably maybe between biology and this class is that um, they want you to look at microscopic pictures of these organelles and be able to kind of sort of determine what you're looking at when you see a microscopic photograph 
of a cell under high magnification. Um, so we know the cell membrane, we know what it is, we know it controls what comes in and out of the cell. We know that there are proteins embedded in that uh, cell membrane that allow different things to happen. It receives instructions from other cells. I'm going to talk about these different active and passive um, entry here. Actual, it's kind of neat when you see it, a real picture rather than a drawn picture. Just being able to recognize that is quite amazing. Nucleus, genetic material, real simple. Um, remember that there are pores in the nuclear membrane, which is very similar. It's a bio, uh, lipid layer, very similar to the um, cell membrane. And the pores allow the nuclear material, the messenger RNA, to go out and find a ribosome and be um, transcribed into um, using amino acids from the transfer RNA, the tRNA, right? I'm, am I bringing some memory back? Um, to make proteins in the cell. Different sequences of amino acids make your proteins. Um, yeah, that's about all I have to say about that right now. So endoplasmic reticulum, there is this rough and the smooth, remember, has ribosomes. Why it's rough? Looks rough. I don't know if it's actually rough, probably not, but um, and then the smooth does not. It synthesizes steroid ho hormones. That's why you're going to see a large cells in the testes and the ovaries are going to have more SER, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, than other cells in the body. Okay, and then from here, the proteins are butted off and moved to the Golgi apparatus for packaging and delivery. And then the, here's the ribosomes. Remember, they're made in the nucleolus. Um, they are responsible for protein synthesis. There are ones that are associated with the endoplasmic reticulum near the nucleus and the free ones in the cytoplasm. So here's what the rough ER looks like. And then remember that the amino acids come in by the transfer RNA, they meet with the messenger RNA, the subunits meet up, the adenines, the thymines, the, the uracils, um, the guanines, and um, they make proteins, chain, right? Certain chain. Golgi body. Here we are. Um, I don't remember teaching this definition in biology, but if you look at many of the um, examples in Ace Marine, in the pictures, you will see that, that there's a cis face and a trans face. Cis is Latin for on this side, and trans is Latin for on the other side. That's how they determine. So if you see the Golgi apparatus and the nucleus is over here, where the rough ER is, you know that this is the um, cis side, so on this side of the nucleus, and then on the other side of the nucleus. And the series of transport goes in that direction. So, and it makes these vesicles that are carrying proteins out of and to other parts of the cell for use. Really kind of neat how it all comes together. And it also produces those lysosomes that go out and break down waste products in the cell. Mitochondria. This is very easy to recognize, very, usually a smaller, and there's multiple of them, organelle in um, both plant cells, because plant cells undergo um, cellular respiration just like animal cells do, but in the dark, in the light, they do photosynthesis. Um, they have to use the energy they make, right? So they have to have both processes going on. Um, and producing ATP. <clears throat> And they have this um, membrane and an inner membrane that increases surface area. And that's what you see these folds here. And then it, cells that have high energy requirements like muscles are going to have more mitochondria. Chloroplasts. So we're only going to slide 17. So we only have seven slides left after this. But the last one requires math. So um, we know that this is akin to, it's like a mitochondria, but 
It's not found in animals, it's only found in plants. Um, this is an, a picture of one that has the stacked um, grana, stacked thylakoid membranes, these are grana, and that is um, where the light-dependent stage occurs. Stroma are where the light-independent stage occurs, and that's the stuff in between the stacks of, th of uh, thylakoids, okay? Trapping light energy to make glucose. Cell wall, we know animals don't have this, but plants do. Um, here's a structure of cellulose microfibrils that make up the cell wall that give plant that support, also prevents the cells from bursting due to the inflow of water. You've seen droopy plants and you've seen non-droopy plants. Well, sometimes um, when they're pulling in water fast, the cells can swell up, and those cells walls, cell walls prevent them from uh, prevent the cells from bursting, from popping. From, it's called lysing, the biological term L Y S E, lyse to lyse to, to to burst. Okay. And here's um, an actual micrograph um, showing the cell the cell walls between the cells and all those green dots are chloroplasts. So that would most likely be the tissue of a leaf rather than a stem or a root. Large permanent vacuole, also only in plants. Animals have small, animal cells have smaller vacuoles, but only in the plants will you see that large central vacuole. And depending upon how much water the plant has at the time, or what angle you're shooting this, your image from, you might not see it as pronounced as these pictures are showing, okay? And it's not just for storing water, it also stores pigments and waste products. Okay, so we're done with that. So I told you it was, it was just gonna be a quick review of those individual pieces, not all of them and not in depth, okay? Because I, I understand that, that, you know, I think I only have like two or three students out of 74 students who haven't had biology yet in my ACE Marine classes. So you guys are just going to have to study those index cards a little bit more than the rest of us. Okay. Um, so this next section, we're going to be describing that fluid mosaic membrane, which again, we also did um, in biology class. But we know that these are hydrophobic and hydrophilic ends. The hydrophobic ones are gonna be in the um, middle and the hydrophilic, the water loving, are going to be on the outside. And that's how they line themselves up when they are being created. And then the proteins are embedding themselves in there to do certain things. Some of them serve as markers or, hey, this is me, this is my cell. I'm not a foreign cell. Others serve for transport, either active transport or passive transport. <clears throat> See, and that's what I was talking about, the hydrophobic hydrophilic, the fatty acid tails on the phosphate heads. So carrier proteins bind um, to certain substances and they change shape to allow the protein to go through. And channels, are essentially pores, hallways, passages that um, allow certain small substances like water, for example, to pass in and out of the cell um, without too much control. But it's very rare that a molecule can do that. Most molecules have to be brought through through carrier because they're larger or dangerous. Selectively permeable nature. So um, what, is a, what does that mean? We're talking about um, active versus passive here. So active versus passive. The basic difference between the two is that active requires energy and passive does not, which is what I was just talking about with the different kinds of proteins. So if you look here, facilitated diffusion, uh, passive transport, 
So facilitated means it needs a protein. Um, some things can go right through the lipid bilayer. Active transport requires ATP to be used to bring it in, and it's typically against a concentration gradient because nature does not allow that. So you need to take a step further, which is still nature, but you need to take it, nature needs to go a step further to allow that against the concentration gradient. We'll talk more about what that means momentarily. So small and nonpolar, like oxygen and carbon dioxide, for example, will uh, definitely be used through um, passive. That's something that's happened constantly. Water molecules passing right through the lipid bilayer and through the channels as well. And then you would need the carrier proteins, the facilitated diffusion for larger lipid insoluble solutes. So they can't go into the lipid bilayer. So this is what we've been working on in class for a little while, describing, describing and interpreting, speak proper English, um, photo micrographs, electron micrographs, and drawings. So all three of these. And we have a lot of practice with external, larger, and some internal uh, anatomical features of organisms, but we haven't gone down in this class to the cellu cellular level yet. Um, until this unit. Uh, we worked on a little bit, you know, um, this week with the workbook, okay? But um, it's really, the hardest part is just deciphering the differences between the different organelles and being able to have enough knowledge to say, to figure out, well, that looks like, you know, um, the, Endoplasmic reticulum, rough endoplasmic reticulum would be near the nucleus where the Golgi would be farther away from the nucleus. So that's something we did in our drawings from um, last Friday. Okay, so here's some more differences between animal and plant cells. Um, you can instantly tell the difference here because of the large central vacuole, which is, I believe, in this picture, false colored, and the fact that there are these uh, large organelles with the grana and the thy thyloid stacks um, of chloroplasts, okay? And if those things are not present, then you probably have an animal cell, and you can see how it's not, you know, in, 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 a, in a drawing, you're not gonna draw, you're not gonna fill in every space because it can get confusing. You're, this is a teaching tool, so you're only going to have, you know, s small sections of this. Here, it's like virtually everywhere and mixed in with all the different organelles in reality. And depending upon what cell, right, what type of cell you're talking about. All right, so here's where we're going to stop with a little bit of math, but it's easy math. It's, um, it's no different than when you learned about um, density equals mass over volume, the, the density formula. This is virtually the same thing. Um, actual size is equal to image size over magnification. Um, image size is equal to actual size times magn magnification, and so on and so forth. So you're just using this triangle as a photographic way to memorize what direct, you know, what um, math you use to solve a problem, to solve any problem that we have. So we are going to have a few sample problems right now, two sample problems, and then we're going to jump into the workbook to um, work on this some more after these notes. Okay, so let's go over the sample problems. The steps are here, they're in your notes. Um, First, you measure the length of the image with a ruler, so you would need a ruler. 
metric ruler, not inches. Ensure you have the same units for image length and actual length. So these two measurements have to be the same units. Typically, it would be millimeters or micrometers with the mu letter M. So it's MM for millimeters and mu, the Greek letter M, for micrometers. And they are three decimal places apart. Okay, so you're either typically going to be multiplying by a thousand or dividing by a thousand to convert one into the other. And then you're going to use the formula, which is here, um, for magnification by dividing the image length by the actual length to get the magnification. So this is a division sign and this is a multiplication sign. We all understand that, yes? All right, let's take a look at two samples. All right, so example number one. And if you've ever not known what EG, it's Latin for, for example. Many people use EX, but I mean, I guess it's acceptable, but it's not what it's supposed to be used for. Um, look it up, it means something else. So a cell, here's an, here's an example of a problem. <clears throat> A cell has an actual length, so we're talking about this number here, of 81.8 micrometers. See the Greek letter mu? The image length of the cell, now we're talking about that number, of the photomicrograph is measured at 90 millimeters. So these are not the same units. So if you're looking at two, ensuring that you have the same units, we have a little problem there that we have to figure out. So let's look at how we do this. So you convert the 90 millimeters into micrometers. You just multiply by 1,000. I told you you're either going to be multiplying or dividing by 1,000, essentially moving that decimal place one, two, three. To the, if you're going from the larger to the smaller, it's gonna be three places to the right, if, and vice versa if you're going the other way, okay? So you get 90,000 micrometers. And now that you have two, your two numbers, you can, math, you can do the math. So it's 90,000 divided by 81.8, which is the actual length. So it's the image length divided by the actual length is going to give you the magnification, which is x to 1100. 1100 x, doesn't matter which way you put it, I think. Um, that, that just means times, 1100 times greater than its actual size. That's the magnification that you're looking at. If there's any questions, I will pause the video and he will try to answer it. He will try to answer it. All right, example number two. A mitochondrion, that is the singular of mitochondria, um, has a magnification of 40,000 times, x 40,000. The image length is 60 millimeters. So now we have magnification and we have image. We need the actual. So what do we do? Seems like straight up division to me. Because remember, this is a division symbol. That divided by that equals that. So actual length, 60 millimeters. And your answer is obviously going to be in millimeters, but you can, you can convert it. You probably should convert it to micrometers because you're talking about um, actual length of something small. And you know, I believe the standard measurement for actual length is micrometers so but either answer would probably be right unless they specifically ask in the question to give your answer in micrometers you could probably give it in kilometers well that would be pretty pretty dumb okay um, so it's just simple division 60 over 40,000 gives you your actual okay so we're gonna do a little bit more of this practice in our workbooks at this time.